So good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's WeConnect International webinar. Um, my name is Maggie Berriam and I am the Executive Director for WeConnect International here in Europe and I'm delighted that you've joined us for today's webinar which is the Fab Quotient, your toolkit for fighting fatigue and staying resilient in business. Um, this webinar is being presented by Celine Erasmus. She's one of our self-registered women-owned businesses based in South Africa. She's a registered dietitian and works as a full-time professional speaker and writer. Um, and she is passionate about equipping busy entre entrepreneurs with the practical tools and techniques that will help enhance their own performance, help them manage fatigue and boost their energy levels. Today's session is going to offer some practical solutions to the challenges of our high stress, low energy lifestyles um, and specific Crystal will be telling us more about the Fab Quotient, a revolutionary approach that will help you to fight fatigue and be brain fit. Now, Fab stands for fueling, activation, and behaviour, and I'm really looking forward to finding out a bit more. Um, so Lynn's going to talk to us for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll open up the discussion to questions. To keep background noise to minimum, everybody's going to be on mute, so please use the chat functionality if you've got any urgent questions that you want to ask um, while Selene is speaking. The session is being recorded, so you will be able to listen back to it again, and we'll also be sharing the slides afterwards. So, Celine, thank you very much for presenting us today. I am going to pass the presenter rights over to you, and thank you, thank you for presenting the session for us. Here you go. Thank you. I'm delighted to meet everybody, and I hope we have an opportunity to, to connect in person after the session. If you have any questions while we're chatting, feel free to, to write a comment on, on the right-hand side where, where you can chat. Otherwise, we'll make sure that we have time just to, to interact after the session. I'm assuming that this topic must have caught your attention for a variety of reasons. And although I live in South Africa, I do a lot of work in, in the UK in the Middle East. I've spent just over three months in the UK this year. And my experience shows me that it doesn't matter which hemisphere I'm in and who I'm generally meeting, there are a lot of people that are struggling to fight fatigue and to stay resilient and um, to manage all the demands that are placed on us. Because as we know, the, the pace of business today demands more and more outputs. Um, but generally, we don't always have all the resources to support us. And time is a finite resource. So it doesn't matter what business we run, or, or who we are, in fact. We only have 24 hours a day. Whereas energy is a renewable resource. So looking at how we manage our energy and how we stay resilient is a far more effective way in terms of managing our performance. So my objective for this late afternoon session is to share with you some key strategies that not only work for me, but also for many of the individuals that I work with and I'd like you to feel that you have got strategies that can help you be your very own CEO. And for me, that title is, uh, some, some of you may be a CEO, but for me, it implies that you are your own chief energy officer. So that means that you are able to mobilize and manage your energy, that wonderful renewable resource that we all have very effectively, because as a business owner, as a human being, as, as a mom or a wife or a friend or whatever role you may play, be it many, I do believe one of the greatest assets any of us can have is the ability to mobilize energy on demand. So that's my outcome for you, is to share some strategies that can help you to manage your energy more efficiently so that even though things are crazy out there and there are days and weeks perhaps where things Things don't always work out and we need to manage our energy and our ability to bounce back. We are then able to do that. So what makes it difficult in terms of managing our energy, I think a person that kind of positions this topic very well is Dr. Tony Schwartz, who heads up the Energy Project. And he wrote a, a paper in the Harvard Business Review where he compared professional athletes with working people who I call corporate athletes. And I know that some of you that are listening may be quite sporty and active, but chances are you wouldn't classify yourself as a professional athlete, 
but you certainly would think of yourself as a corporate athlete. I know I do. I mean, it feels like I run a marathon every day. And it's just that rat race. And we don't get seasons off. We don't have personal teams with dietitians and personal trainers and coaches to help support us. So as, as corporate athletes, it's important to manage our energy. And our energy happens on different dimensions. So the conversation we're having tonight is predominantly looking at the base of that pyramid. So you can see there that the bottom layer is about physical energy or physical performance. And in the work that I've done, I qualified as a person, as a, a dietitian uh, 16 years ago. And the first five years of my career were spent in clinical practice. And I just found that I was really dealing with a lot of people that had, had high IQ and high EQ. So great skills and strengths, great attributes, in, in phenomenally high self-awareness. But it didn't matter what their IQ and EQ was, if they did not have the energy to get out of bed in the morning, then none of their skills and strengths and talents would ever operate at optimum. So taking a look not only at how do we build on our strengths within our work environment, but also looking at how we support ourselves in terms of EQ and IQ is incredibly important. And then I'll tell you about a quotient that myself and my business partner have launched that helps to support that very important part of the performance pyramid, which the more we demand of ourselves in terms of EQ and IQ, the more we need to look at managing this foundation. And I think a lot of what I might share, I certainly find that in the work that I do, a lot of what I share tends to be quite common knowledge. So we know the basics around managing energy and being well, but common knowledge does not always imply common practice. And so we're going to take a look at practical steps that can over help us to overcome very real challenges. One of the challenges that we face today, the reality is that we are time poor and stress rich. We don't have a lot of time and we're really stressed, a couple of things happen, but the one thing that happens is that our lifestyles get affected. Good habits go out the proverbial window, so we don't eat as well, perhaps we don't get to rest or sleep as much as we should, we maybe find it difficult to exercise, and then those bad habits get reinforced. And another challenge is that as human beings, we just don't change easily. My business partner is a human behaviorist, and I'm intrigued how important this, this aspect is. And as we wrap up the presentation, I'll share with you some of the exciting research around human behavior and specifically around sustainable lifestyle change. I've recently completed a course on tiny habits by Professor B.J. Fogg at Stanford, and it's remarkable how easy it is. But when we're time poor and stress rich, we sometimes don't think the easy things are the best way out. And what happens is we will look for information in various platforms, maybe books, maybe the, the internet. And when it comes to health, energy, resilience, it's a topic that is incredibly filled with information. So much so that I think we end up with decision fatigue. So Greg McCowan, who wrote the book Essentialism, which is an excellent read for any business owner, he highlights the fact that when we have lots of information on a particular topic, what can happen is that we get immobilized and we end up not taking action at all, and especially when the information seems to be contradictory. And in my field as a dietitian in South Africa, and I've seen it in the UK early this year, the, the conversations and debates around, is sugar okay, is sugar not okay, should we be banting and eating high protein, high fat diets, are all carbohydrates bad, and there's a lot of confusion, and that's just in one space of wellness and energy and resilience. So we've got to be sure that when we try and look for information, that we get it from a credible source, and that it's also easy enough to implement into our busy lives and we don't end up immobilized. And so to help us with that, over the past decade, I have worked with many corporates. I do full-time presenting to business schools and various corporate clients. And along with IQ and EQ, I believe that we need to look at our FAB quotient. So FAB Q is the base of that pyramid in terms of supporting high performance. It's what we need to have in place, the fundamental things in order to support our performance and resilience. So the FAB quotient takes a look at three multi-pronged components that help us create resilience. The first one is fuel, which is around how you feed and fuel your body. So it's about nutrition. 
The second aspect is activation, which is around how you move your body, not just in terms of exercise. I mean, we all know exercise is good for us. I can tell you when I have a 10 or 12 hour day, finding the time to exercise is not always that easy. But activating, it takes a look at how you can incorporate the latest in neuroscience in terms of boosting your brain, boosting your body while you're at your desk, while you're commuting, while you're standing in a queue, while you're presenting in a meeting. So I'm going to share with you a few activation techniques that I use personally and that work well with many of my clients. And then the third component of the FAB quotient is taking a look at behavior. So how do you behave in terms of towards yourself and towards others? So the idea of the behave component is to help you not only behave authentically and play to your strengths, and I'll share an assessment that has been life-changing for me and that we continue to use in the work that we do, but also how to collaborate more powerfully. Because as business owners, we need to be able to collaborate and build on our strengths, not just with ourselves, but with colleagues and clients and people that we, that we work with. So if we take a look at the FAB quotient, I thought it might be fun to start off with one of the most important activations that you can do. So I don't know where you're sitting. I'm, I've recently moved to a new place, so I've got a, an office that I'm not used to sitting in, but fortunately I have a comfortable chair, so I'm sitting upright. What we know about posture is that posture has a direct effect on your internal chemistry. So that lady that you can see in the picture, that's Amy Cuddy. You may have heard about her. If not, I'm going to share with you after tonight's webinar some resources, and one of them will be a link to her TEDx talk where she spoke about her research in the area of how posture and power poses in particular can affect your body chemistry for the better. So I'm gonna summarize what her TED Talk is. Basically, when you sit upright or stand upright in what we call a power pose. So perhaps do this now. Uh, just become aware of how you're sitting. I'm hoping that you're not slouching, that you're sitting quite comfortably, dignified upright. You are welcome to stand and listen to this webinar. We know that when you stand, you also can shift your energy levels, which is quite good. And what happens if you hold a power pose for just two minutes? So we're not talking about half an hour or two hours. After just two minutes, Amy Cuddy's research showed that chemistry starts to shift inside. What happens is your stress hormone, cortisol, starts to decrease and your dominant hormone, testosterone, starts to increase. This is an incredibly powerful quick win. So when you're maintaining proper posture, not only do you reduce that fight or flight response that so many of us feel because we just function off stress and we function at levels of high anxiety, but by sitting upright, by standing upright, you can also increase your dominant hormone, testosterone, which is incredibly good because that makes you not only feel more confident, but also act more assertively. So if you're interested in this, I'd really recommend that you watch the video when you get the link after tonight's webinar. So sit, sit up right, feel free, feel free to stretch, especially if you've had a long day. Uh, we're one hour ahead of you. So um, yeah, I've been working for about 11 hours now. And fortunately, I have managed to fuel and activate today, so I'm feeling very energized and focused. But one day, you may not have the chance to have everything go your way, and just be aware of how simply sitting upright and ergonomically in the office space that you sit in and work in, how that can perhaps not be good for your posture, and that could be one place to invest, even if it means getting a lumbar support for your back, I've got a special cushion that I put into my car seat and I can't believe that it took me this long to sit more comfortably in my car. So we've taken a look at one activation. What I'd like to do now is go to the first part of the FAB quotient, which is fueling. And fueling is something that we have to do, yet it's something that we don't often spend a lot of attention on. So the one aspect that I wanted to, to focus on, there are two fueling strategies that I'm gonna leave with you this, this afternoon. The first one is around strategic refueling. So how would you answer that question to yourself? The question is, are you a strategic refueler? Now, I know that in business, you have strategies. Strategy simplified would imply that you have a plan and some kind of timing associated to the plan. So when it comes to the way that you feed yourself, the way that you feel your body, 
Do you have a plan of sorts and do you have some kind of timing? Some of you may be nodding, you may be shaking your head, maybe shrugging. Let me show you what I generally come across. I find that many individuals wake up in the morning and there's morning madness. So there's dogs to feed, kids to drop off, um, things to get do doing. So we skip breakfast or we grab something on the run or maybe we get something when we get to our first client or the office. We then have back-to-back -back meetings. So we have back-to-back -back cups of coffee. If we're lucky, a handful of biscuits. Maybe we grab a quick sandwich for lunch. Then in the late afternoon, we may look for a snack because our, our blood sugar levels drop. And by the time we get home and we relax after this marathon that we've run, we have a glass or two of wine and we have our biggest meal late in the day. I'm not sure if you can resonate with aspects of what I've just gone through, but I know that sure, the majority of individuals that I work with at various business schools, various clients across different industries, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, this tends to be quite a common strategy that people um, put, put into place. If you, if you resonate with aspects of this, so skipping meals, perhaps drinking too much caffeine, maybe too much sugar, eating your biggest meal quite late in the day, what happens is that your source of energy, which is your blood glucose or your blood sugar in layman's terms, is going to follow that curve that you can see. It's almost like a roller coaster throughout the day. So there'll, there'll be periods of time your source of energy drops. There'll be periods of time where your energy source spikes and lots of variation in between. What we know about this, and this is a little bit of physiology and biology, and it's the only bit I'm going to share with you. The reason why I share it is because if you want to be your very own CEO, your own chief energy officer, this is the most important fundamental step in terms of managing your energy that you need to understand. Your blood glucose levels will affect not only your physical energy, but your mental and emotional sense of energy as well. When your blood sugar drops, not only do you physically feel tired, perhaps even a bit faint and weak, but there's an area in your brain which we call the, the amygdala. It's the reptilian part of the brain. I like to call it my lizard. And what happens when my, my blood sugar drops is that my lizard completely overrides and hijacks my wizard. Now, the wizard is the front part of the brain. So if you take your right hand and place it over your forehead, as if you had a headache. That's the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that is involved with what we call executive function. So things like decision making, problem solving, creativity, focus, short term memory. And that's the first part of the brain that gets hijacked by the lizard, which tends to override once you're not eating or your blood sugar drops. So don't be fooled. Your energy levels may be high because you may be functioning in a high state of cortisol and adrenaline or having lots of caffeine, but actually your mental performance and resilience is not working at optimum if you don't manage your blood sugar. Then at the other end of the spectrum, if your blood sugar is too high, there are quite serious health repercussions. We know that if your blood sugar stays too high for too long, you can predispose yourself to diabetes, heart disease, hypertension. Even there's some research showing that you can increase your risk for certain cancers and dementia or Alzheimer's. So having high blood sugar is not good. It also lowers your immune system. So at the moment, we're experiencing winter, so we're not having long, warm summer days like those of you who may be in the northern hemisphere. But when you have high blood sugar on a consistent basis, your immune system is not that strong. So if you happen to fall ill, you may be sicker for longer than you need to be. And then the third thing, uh, and I think as ladies, we're often very concerned about this. When your blood sugar fluctuates a lot, you produce extra hormones like insulin. And the combination of these fluctuating insulin levels with stress hormone cortisol is what I call a recipe for disaster. It turns you into a lean, mean storage machine. What I mean by that is that you end up storing weight very easily, even if you don't eat a lot. And where would you store that weight? Well, some of you might have guessed it. Yeah, around your waist. And what we know is that a lot of the health experts like cardiologists have proven that if you carry excess weight around your waist, you put yourself at a much higher risk 
of those conditions that I just mentioned. So diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, uh, certain um, Alzheimer, dementia type conditions, and even cancers. And those conditions account for sure, about 70 to 80% of all disability and death, which is having a huge impact on bottom line and workforce and healthcare systems um, across the globe. But I'm more concerned about you. I don't want to spend tonight talking about the healthcare system. I want to talk about your well-being. So it, we see when your blood sugar drops too low, it's not good for your brain. Your lizard takes over your wizard. If it's too high, you get sick easily, you put on weight, and you increase your risk for many diseases of lifestyle. Ideally, we want to keep our blood glucose, our source of energy, as constant as possible, and that keeps us within what I call the performance zone. One way to get this right, so that you can support your energy physically, emotionally, mentally, which will then help you to self-actualize and achieve all the goals that you'd like to, both in your work and private life, one strategy to do this is to look at strategic refueling. Now, strategic refueling, I must say, perhaps at this point, I should mention that even though I am a nutritionist, a dietitian, I know that sometimes we make the assumption that when we hear a speaker speaking about a particular topic, that that person must do whatever they're talking about accurately. I know that for myself, um, what I'm sharing with you, I don't do all the time. I am French by heritage. My family are based in Champagne. I mean, how lucky am I? I just, I, I have been brought up in a context of you know, bubbly is for every occasion and food needs to taste good. What I also appreciate, though, is that I can't drink as much champagne as I would like to and eat as much baguette and cheese, I love cheese, and still manage my energy, my ability to stay resilient. So I do strategic refueling most of the time. So I follow the 80-20 principle. That implies doing what I'm sharing with you 80% of the time. 20% of the time when I'm traveling or I've been called into a crisis or a meeting has run over time or I've hit another traffic jam, I don't stress about it. So this is what I do most of the time. Breakfast within two hours of waking should be a non-negotiable. There are many breakfast ideas on my blog which I'll share with you when we wrap up. Then, you need to have what I call strategic snacks in your environment. So right now where you are sitting, I would jump for joy if you are able to pull out what I call a strategic snack. So in your desk drawer, you need to have these kind of snacks in your handbag, in your computer bag. If you travel like I do, you need to have the right kind of snacks in your travel kit or in your car if you spend a lot of time driving. Why I say this is I don't have time for lunches on most days, but I always have time to grab a quick strategic snack. A very important time to think about strategic refueling is in the late afternoon. Many of us eat some kind of breakfast. We may grab a lunch, but sometimes we have a very large gap between lunch and our evening meal. If that gap is longer than five hours, and for some of us it could be seven or eight hours, you are more likely to overeat at a time of day where you don't need all that fuel. You need the energy during the day, not just before you're about to go and sleep and rest for the next, hopefully, seven to eight hours. That's the amount of sleep that we need, and we'll chat about sleep in a moment. And I find by having a snack in the late afternoon, even if that means while you're commuting home, at the end of work, which may be a strange time for you to think about eating, the outcome, as it has been for many of my clients, is that you, it makes it easier to eat less late at night. This kind of strategic refueling can help you to keep your source of energy within that performance zone, which will help you mentally, physically, and emotionally. So I'd like to take a look at what a strategic snack looks like, because I do not want you to leave this webinar and think that tomorrow you can have a handful of wine gums or a bar every two hours. Ideally, a strategic snack, if it has a label on it, I think reading labels is important. They teach us a lot about the foods that we eat. However, there's a lot of information on a label, and I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. So I'd like you to look at two things. If you're a lady and you're wanting to stick to the correct portion for a what I call a strategic snack, you'd like your snack to provide 120 calories. If you're using the metric system, then you would multiply by four, and that would give you 500 kilojoules. And then at the same time, it's a good idea to always look at the list of ingredients. By law, the ingredients should always be listed in descending order. 
So the first three or four ingredients in any item are going to be the, the ingredients that take up the biggest or largest volume. And if you spot sugar or one of its uh, derivatives, which is difficult because there's about 52 approved names for sugar. So maybe you might spot things like maltodextrin or high fructose corn syrup or dextrose. Then ideally, it's not a strategic snack if sugar is in one of the top three ingredients. Once again, on my blog, there are various snack ideas. I've just got a couple of pictures here. These are my personal favorites. Now I'm really showing that I'm a continental. On the left, you can see there, those are blocks of of cheese with fruit. I often do the combination of protein from the cheese with fruit or vegetables. That gives me a bit of fiber. Then uh, a handful of nuts, dried fruit, and more or less a handful, and you know that you're sticking to 120 calories. So I don't want you to get too fanatical about reading and counting calories. If it's fitting into your hand, it's probably the right portion. So no, you don't want to open a huge bag of your favorite nuts and end up eating the whole packet in one afternoon. That wouldn't be strategic. Um, then, if we take a look, I wonder if Maggie, could we show the video here which shows the effect that a strategic snack can have? Are, are we able to do that? Yep, just give me a second and I will upload it for you. Thank you. We're hoping, we're hoping it's going to work. We, we tried this earlier, so hopefully the video will work for you all. So just bear with me a second. Thank you. Such feelings coming up today. There is wonder in most everything I see. Not a cloud in the sky got the sun in my eyes and I won't be surprised if it's a dream. I'm on top of the world. This is the end. Beautiful friend. This is the end. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. So as you can see, you can literally bounce back and stay resilient. It could be you at five o'clock in the afternoon, every afternoon. I think we underestimate the impact that strategic refueling can help, can, can do in terms of our ability to bounce back. Uh, and it, I'm not sure what organizations you, re you, you represent, but I just thought I'd share some of the great um, response that this was Google had a, a canteen nudge. And a nudge is what we'll wrap up the presentation with. A nudge is a tiny little behavior change. So all they did is they changed the size of the plates in their office cafeteria from 12 inch plates to nine inch plates. And over a certain period of time, the employees at this particular cafeteria actually consumed 31 and a half million less calories. So it is the small things that we do that can play a huge role in terms of our ability to stay resilient and energetic. I've highlighted that activations are about moving during your workday. A lot of us, well, we know exercise is good, and I don't think we, we know how to be active during the day while we're sitting at our office chair. Sadly, sitting is the new smoking. We know there's research to support that even if you do exercise every day, if you are spending many hours sitting, you increase your risk for gaining weight and for many 
of those lifestyle diseases that I mentioned. And you also increase your risk for musculoskeletal issues, which is why taking a look at your ergonomic environment and starting off with your posture is absolutely key. What I've had a lot of fun doing in the last two or three years is to incorporate activations in the workplace and with my clients. So for instance, you can see that lady squatting. I literally, in all the workshops that I run, every 20 minutes to half an hour, we spend two minutes moving. And one of the most effective, quick and easy activation exercises you can do is to squat above your chair, say for 10 or, or 15 squats. And what you'll do is you'll increase your, your heart rate, which will then create an energy lift and also carry oxygen and nutrients, not just to your muscles, but also to that four pound universe that sits on top of your shoulders, your brain. So the, this was the highlight of my year last year. I worked with the, in the UK in Liverpool with the MAC Cosmetics brand leadership team. And this was at their conference. I spent three days with them and they, they asked me to incorporate activations every 90 minutes. And the results were astounding. The delegates were more engaged, more retentive. They ate less of the afternoon snacks and the energy levels were really high. So my question to you is, could this be your next meeting break? Uh, you could have stand-up meetings. You could perhaps incorporate stability balls instead of just chairs. Some of my clients are putting in activation zones. They don't need a big investment. You just need a small area a few items, some stretch bands, for instance, a water cooler, and you create or you make it easier for this kind of culture to happen in your organization. These were, I've received this picture not that long ago. It's a group that I worked with in Blackpool, in fact, uh, some CEOs, and we used the stretch bands without even standing up. We managed to shift their energy, and you can see, um, I think they all look quite happy too. There are quite a few mobile apps that are available. I think there are 47,000 fitness-related apps. So I'm going to share with you my top three. I will include the link to these apps in the, in the list of resources. The reason why I include these is because if you love what you do, chances are hours can go past and you'll forget to activate. So maybe you need a little nudge and some of these kind of apps can help nudge you in terms of remembering to move, remembering to do simple things like taking deep breaths or maybe drinking water. The, the B part of the FAB quotient, which looks at our behavior, we know that we are born with our IQ. We have a certain character or personality trait that we are born with, and we have EQ. Now, personality, is the one thing that can help us to understand our strengths. I know there are many, many personality assessments out there. The one that myself and my business partner, Joni Petty, so she's the lady on the left, that's the cover of our book that was launched two months ago. Um, hold on, is she on the left or the right? She's on the right. Sorry, I don't even recognize myself. So Joni on the right is a human behaviorist She's the founder of the Enneagram Institute in South Africa, and she does a lot of work with the Enneagram Institute in New York. If you have not been exposed to this tool, I would highly recommend that this is one website that you visit. It, uh, the website link is at the bottom of the slides, and we will include it in the list of resources. What this assessment does in terms of helping people with their FAB quotient is you can know what to eat. You can know how to move. But if you don't understand your own personal stresses and strengths and triggers to your behavior, then it's going to be quite difficult. And that's why we use this particular approach to helping people understand the, the personality that they are born with and how to play to their strengths and, of course, how to collaborate better with others. It's a phenomenal tool that I'm not going to go into detail tonight. We don't have enough time for that. But there is a free assessment on the website. There's also a more comprehensive assessment on the same website that is $12 that can be hugely insightful. If you happen to do the assessment and you'd like some feedback, you're welcome to be in touch with me, and I will then put you in touch with Joni, who is available to do online um, Skype coaching, if, if you would like that. So the third quotient, another activation besides looking at our posture and moving more often and not sitting for too long, is to do something better. Because 
all of us breathe. It does not mean that we breathe as best as we could. What we know about breathing is that it's a very powerful activation tool that helps to integrate the brain and the body. When we concentrate on taking deep breaths, not only do we get extra oxygen into our system, but we also reduce the fight or flight response. This is a personal habit that I'm working on in 2015. So I find that I'm a very highly energetic person. I, I move quickly. I'm hoping I'm not speaking too quickly. Um, and I find breathing has helped me to not only pace myself and slow down, but it helps me to choose how I'm going to react. So if I'm in a meeting or if I'm having a difficult or a confrontational engagement, by simply breathing, I can determine better behavior. So not only physiologically, but also in that sense, it helps. A wonderful breathing technique is the 478 breathing technique that Dr. McCullough and Dr. Val speak about. There's a lovely five minute video that I'm going to share the link to, which Dr. McCullough takes you through the 478 breathing technique, which is grounded in science. And if this is a particular activation that you'd like to integrate into your life, I would really recommend that this is a particular breathing technique that you start with. I've been using this breathing technique not only during the day, I use it before I present to try and uh, manage the adrenaline that I always feel, even though I've been speaking professionally for over a decade, but I use this with great positive effect at night. So um, some of us perhaps struggle to switch off our heads at night, especially if we're really engaged with work and perhaps going through difficult times. And by breathing and using a particular breathing technique like the 478 breathing technique, you can increase the parasympathetic response, which helps to lower your blood pressure, integrate right and left brain activity, and they can really bring on relaxation a whole lot faster than if you were not doing it. Once again, if you find that you're just too busy and you want to do these things but you can't, there seems to be an app for everything. So these are three of the apps that I have on my phone at the moment that I'm using. Headspace is one that I discovered in the UK earlier this year. Budify is excellent. I use that on most evenings when I'm going to sleep. And then the mindfulness app on the right is one that prompts me. You decide how often you want to be prompt, prompted. I choose to be prompted three times a day. And then I just do a one minute breathing exercise. And I don't always do them, but 80% of the time when they nudge me, I'm quite grateful that I've got them there. So on the topic of rest, when we work hard as we do and we give and, and give output, it's so important to replenish. And part of building resilience is about getting enough sleep. If you're not able to sleep enough, now the latest research, I'm very intrigued by this topic because I'm not an easy sleeper. And when I travel, it's even more difficult. We know though that if you don't get enough sleep, so if you are not getting, most of us need seven to eight hours of rest a night. There's some research that came out recently that shows that if you get less than five hours of sleep, seven nights in a row. So we're not talking about seven months when you happen to have an infant in the house or a, a, a long year of a startup business. We're just talking one week here. If you don't get enough sleep for one week, your prefrontal cortex, that front of your brain that is involved with executive function, operates at a very similar rate to somebody that may have had one or two drinks. So the headline of, and by drinks I mean alcoholic drinks, I don't mean um, a virgin mojito. And uh, so the headline to this research, to the article was, are you arriving at work drunk? So when we don't get enough sleep, it's almost as if our decision making is, has been affected by alcohol. If you find that you cannot get enough sleep for whatever reason, then another powerful strategy to help with that is to learn how to power nap. My partner, Joni Petty, is very good at this. I'm trying to teach myself, it does take time. But um, if you would like more information on how she does power napping, feel free to contact me and I'll share with you some of her rituals around that. But the biggest thing around sleep and power napping, if it's something you'd like to do, so learn how to have an eight to 12 minute um, sleep wherever you may be. The biggest thing is just giving yourself permission. It's not having the fanciest pillow or the quietest environment. It really is about allowing yourself to do that. The last fueling tip that I want to leave you with seems so simple, but it's so important. It's the issue around hydration. 
When you don't drink enough water or fluids to stay hydrated, three things happen. The first thing is your energy drops. Second thing is you may get a headache. I know that I do. And thirdly, because your mouth is dry, you may have the perception that you are hungry, but that is really a false trigger to eat. So I'd like you to think about whether you drink enough water. I have a formula that I use. So I'm not sure if you have a pen and paper handy. If not, I'll include the formula in the summary notes that we share after the webinar. But the formula is one glass of water for every 10 kilograms that you weigh. So some of you may be using pounds or ounces. Um, the formula is, so you'll need to convert. So it's one glass. A glass is 250 milliliters or about 30, 30 ounces. Right, and that is per 10 kilograms, so per 22 pounds that you weigh. So some of us need five glasses of water, some of us may need 10. It's dependent on our weight. But that is the baseline amount of water or herbal tea or any kilojoule or calorie-free beverage that is also caffeine and alcohol-free that you should be consuming before. Before we add in all the other things like coffees and fruit juices and energy drinks, because many of those things we probably wouldn't drink as much of if we had enough water to stay hydrated. So if we look at, we've been through the fab portions, I've shared with you two tips around fueling, three tips around activation and a, and a quite a strong behavior tip. How do we put this into practice? The course that I did was called Tiny Habits, headed up by Professor B.J. Fogg from Stanford University. And I'll also share the link to his TED Talk because it's really interesting. In fact, he has quite a few. Basically, what he, he's been studying human behavior around healthy living for a very long time. And what he finds is the simpler or the tinier your habit, the better it is. And I find that what we often do, especially as very busy businesswomen, is we set ourselves up for failure. We start on a Monday morning trying to change too much all at once. So Monday we decide it's summer, I want to exercise, I want to lose weight, I'm going to drink water. So we go on to a special detox. By the end of the day, we're tired, we don't get to exercise. The next day we go visit a client or maybe a colleague or somebody arrives and offers us cake. We had some cake and we're like, oh, that wasn't part of the program and I'm traveling this week and the family's coming over for dinner on Friday and we're watching sports and we're planning to have a barbecue and you know what, I'm just going to enjoy this week and the weekend and I'm going to start again on Monday. And this is why I find that people just don't change behavior because we set ourselves up for failure. I would like you to do things differently so that your New Year's resolutions, if you make them in 2016, will never be repeated again. And one way to do that is to create tiny habits that set you up for success. There's some science around these tiny habits. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just think it's really exciting that we, that we know that there's science that support habits. And basically, you can see there in blue, you need three things if you want to create a new behavior. So let's say you want to drink more water or maybe you want to have strategic snacks or you want to breathe more deeply. You need to be motivated to do that thing. So I don't want you to do something just because I said it's a good idea or because your doctor or your partner said it's a good idea. You need to do it because you really want to. The next thing is you need the ability to do that. So physically it doesn't help that you say, um, I'm going to drink more water, but you end up working underground in a mine. I'm using that as an example because I worked with an executive this week that had that difficulty. There's no taps underground in the mines. Then the third thing you need is a trigger. One of the triggers that you can use is, are smartphone applications, like I mentioned, and there are various other triggers too. And if you're interested in this philosophy, you can go to tinyhabits.com. You can sign up for, it's for free, for a week where you'll be taken through this process. So ladies, it's been lovely. I really feel like I've done all the talking. I have done all the talking. What we've discussed, we've been through fueling. We've taken a look at strategic refueling. You have an idea of what a strategic snack is. Very important to have a late afternoon strategic snack. Think about how hydrated you are. I'd like you to have a baseline of one glass of water for every 10 kilograms that you weigh. The power of activations must not be underestimated. So be aware of the way 
that you breathe. You can use breath to relax yourself. You can also use it to energize yourself. We need to rest and recharge as much as we move. And I'd like you to be moving for six minutes every hour. The science is showing that we should be moving for, for every 20 minutes of sitting, we should move for two minutes. So we know sitting is the new smoking, so I'd like you to get up and if you can, change the meeting culture that you're able to. Thirdly, think about how you understand your behavior. One way to start is to know yourself better. A wonderful tool that has been life-changing and that I continue to use is the Enneagram. And how can you put this into practice? I would like you to use the FAB quotient, so fuel, activate, and behave, but within the tiny habits methodology. So ideally, you don't want to change 10 things at once. You want to pick one fueling strategy, one activation strategy, and maybe a behave strategy, or maybe just one of each of the three rather than all of them, and create rituals that become easy to integrate into your lifestyle. And no matter what you do, have fun. So the lady on the right is Joni. I'm the lady on the left. We were just having fun. That was after a long day of taking photographs for our book. And I don't think we laugh enough. So Joni and I are doing a big campaign around happiness at the moment. And the fab quotient ultimately will help you to feel more in control, manage your energy, your health and well-being. And it may be easier for you to have fun when you're feeling all those things. Um, as I've mentioned, we have a book, The Fab Quotient, which is book one of three. The book is available on Amazon. It's also available as a hard copy, but then that would be easier for us to get to you through post, and maybe it's easier for you just to download um, the electronic version. There's also an academy that complements the book, which is a series of five-minute funky videos. And if you'd like to know more about either of these options, you're welcome to contact me. The way to contact me, and please stay connected. You've invested time and energy to be here, and I'd like us to keep this conversation going. I'm very grateful to reconnect for connecting us, but um, I know that what we've spoken about is not like a light switch that you just switch on. It takes time. It takes um, implementing the 80-20 principle before you really feel like you are your own CEO, your own chief energy officer. You're welcome to give me your email address at either of my websites, so Resilient Energy Center or my personal website, Selene Rasmus. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and I would love to hear from you. And let's keep the conversation going, and perhaps I can help nudge you through social media so that you can stay, stay on track. And that brings me to, sure, 45 minutes of chatting. I think I need to hand over to you, and I'm hoping that we have some questions. Thank you, Maggie. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Celine. This has covered so many different things. And I I think one of the things that I really enjoyed at the very beginning when you were talking about professional athletes and corporate corporate athletes and you know, they have the benefit of a complete training team and support team and we need to kind of provide that all for ourselves. And um, and I like the idea of just a strategic snack, because I certainly struggle when I'm out and about in London on busy days just to find something Oh, that's healthy that I want to eat. Um, and so actually having something, you know, already in my handbag or in my desk drawer or something like that is um, would be good. I'm intrigued as well about the 52 names for sugar. If there's a list of them that you can share as well, that would be quite interesting. I, I certainly do look at snacks myself, but I didn't realize there was 52 um, 52 words for sugar that can be used. But that that's fantastic and thank you so much and I will get all the extra resources from you. Um, ladies, I'm going to open up your mics. If anybody's got um, loud background noise, I'll put you back on to mute again. But please do, if you have questions for Celine, please do ask away. So I'm just unmuting everybody just now. Or you can use the, um, the chat functionality, whichever, whichever is easiest. So please, has anybody got any questions for Celine? Uh, hi, it's Marie. Um, uh, what uh, what do you consider uh, as a uh, balanced lunch? Oh, Marie, that that is a great question. So, as a balanced lunch, actually <clears throat> a balanced meal. I, I've got a particular plate model guide that I use, and I'll, I'll include an image of that in the follow up notes. But basically, every meal we have, including lunch, should contain lots of color. Color does not come from, from sweets, of course, or it comes from fresh produce. So ideally, some kind of vegetable or salad, or if you can't do that, fruit, 
and then equal amounts of what I call high fiber, slow release carbohydrate and some lean protein. But the, what must dominate on a meal or lunch ideally is color, which is quite difficult when you're eating on the run because many take out type options tend to be devoid of color and they contain mostly starch and protein only. I've written a, a recipe book. I didn't talk about that, but um, the book is called Fast Food for Sustained Energy. Marie, if you'd like to, you're welcome to respond to the, the follow-up notes, and I will send you a couple of the fast, easy lunch recipes from that book. Yes, because I often have to eat on the run, you know, like in my car between two customers or something. So, uh, you know, the, the usual thing is uh, have a sandwich handy, and that's pretty much all I can eat in the car. Yes, and I, I understand I eat in my car a lot too, and bread is convenient, but it doesn't make it easy to have a balanced meal. So the first thing I'd just suggest is if you are choosing a sandwich as a go-to meal, choose the right type of bread. So choose a bread that is as high in fiber as possible, maybe even labeled as low GI and ideally wheat-free so that you know that you're getting a slow-releasing type of bread, which will help your energy levels stay high throughout the afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marie. Were there any other questions just now? Um, you also talk, um, if I may, um, about a glass of water for every 10 kilos, but what size glass do you mean? Because they vary hugely. Julie, the, the size of the glass is 250 millilitres. Okay. <clears throat> and you said that um, herbal tea, or I, I drink quite a lot of hot water too, um, yes. that would all be acceptable? Absolutely. Um, as long as there's no extra stimulants, so there's no caffeine, because sometimes people who drink a lot of coffee don't think that they're thirsty, but we know that caffeine acts as a diuretic, which means it stimulates um, water loss, urination. So mm -hmm. herbal tea or simply, I often have warm water with ginger or lemon or mint, and that absolutely counts as part of your hydration. Yes. That's okay, because I, I do very much the same, so that's great. Thanks. Great. Are there any more questions? No. No. I can, tell you, I can see you come up on the screen. Um, looking at just looking at the questions that were posed um, ahead of time when people were registering, um, Hilary, actually, you might have asked this: What food should I avoid during my busiest days? So obviously, there's things we know which are good, but are there things which actually, when we're having a really stressed out time, that you know we should really be looking to totally not not be eating or drinking on those days? good question. On a day that you know you're going to be busy, so a day where I know I'm going to be presenting or traveling or, or just seeing clients back to back, I would definitely start my day off with a protein-based breakfast. So I would have maybe, maybe a piece of fruit so that I get some natural sugar in because I find if I don't do that, then I crave sweetness and then I go for chocolate. But I would have protein. So protein would be either egg or cheese or lean meat or sometimes fish like smoked trout or smoked salmon if you can. And starting your day off right on those busy days is very important. And then having the right kind of snacks in your environment and ideally snacks that don't contain sugar. So when I send through the resources, I'll include just a brief one of my blog articles on sugar as well as those listed ingredients. And I would also be careful of products made with a lot of flour because we know that flour is very fast releasing. So it gives you instant energy, but it can make you feel quite tired quite quickly. And products made with flour are many baked products like biscuits, muffins, cakes, rusks. A lot of breads are very high in flour. Um, and many takeaway foods tend to use starch or flour or, or bread, like pizza and that kind of thing, or pizza as a base. And, and I would avoid those. So I would have a protein breakfast and the right kind of snacks throughout the day and to certainly hydrate because when we're busy, it is possible that we end up dehydrating and then we feel more tired than we should with a headache. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've just final final call for any questions on for everybody who's who's dialed in at the moment or anything on the chat function. I don't think there's anything on the chat function. No. Well, it just leaves me to say that, Sylvan, thank you so much for all of that information. And I will, once you've shared with me the, the additional resources, I will put that together with recordings so people, ladies, you can listen back. Uh, and then I'll make sure that you've all got Sylvan's contact details as well. They're obviously on the screen at the moment, but I'll make sure you've got them. So if you would like to um, find out more, if you've got any questions that you don't want to ask just now, then um, you can absolutely contact Lynn, uh, Sylvan directly. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much. And uh, Slim, when are you next back in the UK? Did, would you say it was September time? Yes, I'm coming through to do some work um, in London in round up from the 5th to the 15th of September. Okay. Okay, so ladies, if I'm sure if you were interested also maybe meeting Slim for a coffee or something like that, then she'll be she'll be around um in kind of six to eight weeks or so. So thank you very much. Enjoy your enjoy your evenings and I will look forward to seeing or hearing people on the next webinar or at the next event that we're that we're hosting. But please do keep in touch. And if you have any questions about WeConnect, please please don't hesitate to contact me. And if you have any any questions for Celine, please don't um, hesitate to contact her as well. So thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Thank you Celine. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.